Hello, I'm Andy Dolph. I'm back with Leela Sinha, the author of the forthcoming book, You're Not Too Much, to talk about this idea of intensives and expansives and how that affects parents and children. So for anybody who has not seen the first video we made, which we'll, we'll link to mm -hmm. in the YouTube description, of course, um, can you give a, just a quick review of the intensive expansive framework? Sure. So the 10 second version is there are people who are intense and there are people who are not. Intensives are the intense people. Expansives are the ones who are not. And there you can look at it as a 10 point scale with expansives at the zero end and intensives at the all the way intense 10 end. Um, and uh, most people fall somewhere in the middle. There are occasional people who are really at the extremes. Yeah. And I, I think it's important also for us to mention that it's not that the higher your number, the somehow better you are. No. No, no, you need both ends. We need, as a culture, we really need both ends of the scale. Um, that intensives are the fire lighters, expansives are the fire tenders. If people don't keep the fire going, we get cold. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But one of the things you've talked about, and you mentioned it in the first video we did, is that our culture, in the U.S. anyway, and in a lot of the Western world, I think, is really pretty, pretty uh, favoring of... Bias, toward, a bias yeah. towards expansives. Yeah, yeah. And that has to do, again, I keep alluding to this, and that I think we'll probably do a video about it at some point, but um, that has to do with the history of cultural imperialism and colonialism and um, the cultures that were dominant when the world was being kind of reorganized at that time. Um, those cultures got to define what civilized meant, what refined meant, what good behavior meant. And if you get to define those things, you define them in terms of yourself. And then when you divide the self from the other, that's then the other is almost always considered bad or wrong or less favorable. Yeah. yeah. So it, uh, it occurs to me then that as we think about this in terms of kids and their parents, that if you've got <laughs> an expansive parent uh -huh. who's thinking about the world in terms of appropriate and sort of regimented and evenly paced and they have a very intensive kid who wants to go like crazy and then rest mm -hmm. that that could be a recipe for conflict yes why yes it could i'm shocked that you think that um so what happens with expan especially expansive parents and intensive kids is that the expansive parent expects, we all kind of expect our kids to be like us. We know better, but we kind of all expect it. And um, and full disclosure, I am not a parent, but I spend a lot of time with kids and a lot of time with my friends who are parents. And these conversations have really bubbled up in that context. In fact, I've actually started a Facebook group for parents of intensive kids because I really want to hear from parents and their kids. And that's one of the things about intensive kids is that they really, really have a strong sense of identity from the very beginning and they're not very moldable they're not very malleable they're the people that come out of the womb and they're clearly a person of their own from the very beginning and for a parent who's a little bit softer a little more accommodating a little more laid back i mean it, sometimes it's regimented but sometimes expansiveness is just laid back and relaxed and easy going and go with the flow for a parent like that to have a kid who has very strong opinions and wants it exactly the way they want it from the very beginning is really jarring. And the parent thinks that the kid needs to you know, learn to accommodate the cultural space that they're in, or the parent is just flattened and floored and not sure what to do next. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I'm sure some of the parents who are in this position that are listening to this are thinking, well, okay, I've got an intensive kid. How do I make them into an expansive? Because obviously that's what they should be. And that tends to be the message that intensives get from the very beginning. And the answer is you don't. You cannot make an intensive into an expansive and you cannot make an expansive, expansive into an intensive. So if you're an intensive parent with an expansive kid, you've got a whole other set of problems. Um, but for, for parents of intensive kids, even intensive parents of intensive kids, often the challenge is figuring out how to help the kid develop 
the tools and skills they need to be intensive in an expansive world. Because when they go to school, if they go to school, that's an intensive, unfriendly space. It's, it's, a, it's a resistant space. And if, they have, if they're taking music lessons, you have to choose their music teacher really carefully because an intensive music teacher will get it. And an expansive music teacher will say that, you know, they should be disciplined and go along every day. And, and maybe your kid will love their instrument enough to do that, but maybe your kid will get bored and put it down, even if your kid could be a fantastic musician. And that's the tragedy. That's the loss. Yeah. Or think their flute is more interesting as a cane or a right. baseball bat or something <laughs> than as a musical instrument. Yeah, I don't think a flute would survive that very well. No, I don't either. Um, so... What about the the um, ex intensive parents who have expansive kids? So intensive parents who have expansive kids will get impatient with their expansive kids, just like they get in impatient with the expansive adults around them. They'll want to go further, faster, harder, more, more, more. And then they'll do this thing. They'll fall into this pattern where the parent understands that the easiest way to do something is to do it all at once and then rest. And the expansive kid will get completely overwhelmed, completely toasted. And that's something that I call, um, when an expansive is, is toasted, um, I call that being a fried expansive. So we have squished intensives when you try to make somebody into an, an expansive, and we have fried expansives when you try to make someone into an intensive. And so this all really boils down to Pace and Kylie's usual error, which is to say that the person opposite you doesn't process the world the same way that you do. Yeah. Yeah. And so how do you approach that then? With grace and curiosity and playfulness. Um, when an intensive parent needs to accommodate an expansive kid, they need to understand, or an intensive anybody, an expansive anybody else, they need to understand that it's going to take the kid a little bit of time to process things and that the kid's going to bite off a little bit and then digest it and bite off a little bit more and digest it. And that's okay. That's the hair. And that's the tortoise and the tortoise and the hair story. Mm -hmm. uh, that little bit of a bite, then a little more, then a little more, then a little more, and eventually they'll get there. Fortunately, those kids are actually nourished by the existing cultural structures. And so expansive kids have a much easier time finding support for their personalities in other places. Whereas an intensive kid, especially in an expansive family, we haven't really talked about how institutions and groups can have these same characteristics, but an, an intensive kid in an expansive family will find themselves really, um, really forced into a lot of expansive environments, and there's no external support until they discover the world of, say, extreme sports. And then they suddenly discover that surfers who are surfing 20-foot waves are kindred spirits, and, and then they start to feel like there's an opening in the world. So how do you know whether you have an intensive kid or an expansive kid and how early can you tell um sometimes you can tell really really early the intensive kids show up a little bit differently from the way that you would identify an intensive adult because they haven't been conditioned into expansiveness uh, by their environments yet so an intensive kid will be very opinionated resistant to authority um, will often be labeled defiant or insubordinate if they have a system where that word is used um they're they're enthusiastic and super excited about stuff, but they tend to focus on one thing or a couple of things at once and then shift and shift and shift and shift. And the parents end up wondering why they bought the trumpet and why they bought the paints. And, um, but, but what happens is the kid is usually really creative, usually does a lot of deeply integrated play, um, tends to be able to entertain themselves for long periods of time on their own or demand a lot of attention from the parent all the time, one or the other, typically. We, we, intensives are people of extremes, and it's no different for kids. Um, often they will have a hard time making friends. The friends that they do make will be really solid and loyal, and then there will be everybody else. They will often not be the popular kid. Sometimes they are, mm -hmm. but, but frequently intensives are not the popular kid at school. Um, often they express their opinions really strongly. They tell their friends what to do. They're told they're bossy, especially if they're girls. Um, so there are a lot of ways in which intensive kids show up as problem children in any but the most accommodating child-centered environments. And when you see that come up, 
the natural response of the parents and the natural response of a lot of the authority figures tends to be, is not always, tends to be, oh my God, my child is never going to survive this world. I have to make sure that my child learns how to behave. And that's where the problem starts because the child has a different reward system from the reward system of the other kids. If you think about the Little House on the Prairie stories, Mary is an expensive, Laura is an intensive. Laura's got the interesting story. She's the one who's telling it. Mary is docile and well-behaved. If, if you're familiar with Anne of Green Gables, you have Dora and Davy. Dora is an expansive. Davy's an intensive. You'll notice that in both of those cases, the kind of tomboyish, outdoorish, getting in trouble kid is the intensive. Often those behaviors are characteristic as, as characterized as masculine. And so when you have a girl who's an intensive, you have two layers of stuff to get over, whereas boys are just, ah, boys will be boys. But they're still shunted aside, and they're still categorized as problem children, and often their gifts get lost. So that's why it's so important to identify that you have an intensive child, and then start to work to modify both your parenting and the larger environment that your child has, so that your child can have a nourishing environment. And at the same time, teach your child the gifts and the tools and the resources that the child needs in order to deal with all of those big emotions and big feelings and big ideas. These kids have giant philosophical ideas when they're like five. Yeah. And you have to be able to figure out how to, how to parse that, help them parse that in the world. Um, when I was two, I um, wanted to go to work with my father, which is, you know, kind of normal. You bonded with your parent. You want to go to work with them, right? And I, my father worked as a chemical engineer. There was no way that I could go to work with my father. But I said I wanted to go to work with my father, and my mother said, no, you can't do that, and she turned her back. And my father left for work, and then she went and looked for me. And she found me with my coat on halfway down the driveway. I had, at age two, gotten on my coat, opened the front door, and let myself out, gotten down a flight of about 12 unhandrailed steps, and walked down the driveway because I was going to go to work with my father, even if I had to walk there. That's a classic intensive move, and it classically drove my mother crazy. <laughs> so can you have kids? Sometimes it seems like a lot of kids are really, really intense about some things and not about others. Does that mean they're intensive or expansive, or can they both do that? Well, they can both do that. It's probably an intense... Anybody who's really into some stuff... And then completely shut off about other stuff is probably an intensive. Um, that's the thing that you see is that sort of on off switch. Expansives can be like, well, I'm sort of into this and I'm sort of into that and that's fine. Um, whereas an intensive kid will be all about soccer and then walk away from it. And the parents will say, why did we spend all this money and all this energy on your soccer training? The kid will circle back to soccer, maybe not to high school. But meanwhile, the kid will get really into trumpet and then <laughs> really into painting and then eventually you'll see that come around and it'll get synthesized and may show up in a different way. What was painting may turn out to be animation. But I, I think what I hear you suggesting is that particularly for intensive kids, mm -hmm. whatever experience they have that they're focusing on is going to end up informing other things that they do. So even when they decide that soccer or trumpet or painting or whatever it is, isn't interesting anymore. That maybe a year or five years or 10 years later, that experience is probably going to end up being valuable. So it isn't actually a waste. It's never a waste. Never ever. I, I actually think that's true for all kids. It's never a waste to stimulate them and to allow them to follow their passions or they're not passions. Expansive sometimes don't have passions. That's okay. Um, but it's never a mistake to allow kids to follow their interests because it all percolates through. The things that I'm doing now, the coaching I'm doing now, is completely informed by everything I've done in my life, including information technology. You know, it, it's all in there. Yeah. And so if somebody's listening to this and thinks they really could use some help with it, is that the kind of thing that you do, you can do for them in their coaching? Uh, so, yeah. So what I do with parents of intensive kids is I do um, a kind of interpretation 
So parents will talk to me about what their kids are doing and why the parent is tearing their hair out. And I can channel my inner 10-year-old intensive and tell them maybe a little bit better than the kid is able to articulate at that age what might be going on and what might be useful in that situation. Now, I can't make any promises because intensive kids are absolutely their own people. But having an adult who understands the experience to talk it through often is really, really helpful for the parent. Yeah. Can you give an example of that? An example of having done that? Yeah. Of like a situation where what your 10-year-old perspective was? <laughs> um, so... So I I know I know a couple of kids who are like this. I'm going to aggregate kids mm-hmm. so that I don't actually sure. violate confidentiality. But I know a couple of kids who um, who have a lot of anxiety, which is one of the things that we see really commonly in intensives is high social anxiety, high depression. Trying to fit yourself into a structure that doesn't fit eventually will lead you to some pretty stressed out responses. And so I was talking to I've talked to a couple of parents, and I'm just going to make up a character that's mm-hmm. kind of like what I've done. So I'm talking to a parent and the parent says, my kid is scared of school and is screaming and yelling and doesn't want to go to school and is basically huddled in the corner of the bedroom crying. And I could drag my kid out of the corner and make them go to school. But I really don't feel good about this. Mm-hmm. And I applaud the parent for not feeling good about it because there are parents who would say, well, just suck it up and go to school. That's it. Mm-hmm. Um, And so I was able to say, well, okay, so it sounds like the kid is really not feeling seen and not feeling heard. And I know you think that you have tried to see and hear the child, but apparently it's not working. So let's talk a little bit about what the kid might need in order to feel seen and heard. And even, you know, open that door and ask the kid what it sounds like you don't think I'm hearing you. What do you think you need? Because these kids are so smart. They're so smart about what they need, and they're so smart about the world around them. And opening that conversation allows the parent to then address the need that the kid actually thinks they have, which whether or not it's the actual need allows the kid to relax. Yeah. In some ways, you can treat these kids much more like um, functioning, idealistic, creative adults. You cannot treat them like nine to five busy bee adults because that's not going to work. Yeah. Yeah. That makes sense. That's it's, it's, it's so powerful because it seems like there are so many people in this culture, so many parents who have grown up with this attitude that their job to make their child successful in the world is to instill a sense of responsibility, appropriateness, and discipline. You know, you will not leave the table until you ask permission and I give you permission. Right. You know, just because that's how things should be. Yeah. And I think that's happening less than it was even when we were growing up and (laughs) certainly two generations ago. Um, And it depends on your family. If you're if you come from a military family, things might be a little different. Sure. And there's a whole other thing about intensives in the military. But but I think that what we're starting to see is parents really, the the common goal that the parent and the kid have is that both of you want the kid to succeed. And the question is whether the kid or the parent has a better idea about how that's going to happen. And the answer is often the kid knows. The kid knows what success is going to look like. Mm. That's powerful. It is really powerful. It's also really hard for adults. Yeah. Yeah, it is. And you have to be able to interpret through the kid's eyes. So the kid might describe success in a way that sounds completely impossible. And you have to hear what they're actually saying and go to the vision that they're actually articulating. Yeah. But they are articulating a vision. Yeah. Ask them what it is. Yeah. This, we could continue <laughs> talking about this for hours and days. Uh-huh. And there will eventually be a workshop. <laughs> and that's why it's a book and more books coming yes. and so if people if you are intrigued if you feel like this is helpful if you are looking for individual help with this right now you can contact Leela and she will be happy to coach you and and do amazing things to help you 
And if you're interested in the book or just in the work in general, we will put on the screen all of the information about the places to follow and Twitter and like on Facebook and uh, sign up for the newsletter for announcements and when the book is released and so forth. So, And please get in touch. I absolutely love to have people get in touch about this. This is so important. It, we need it so much. And, and it's for me, it's been such a powerful thing to think about and how often, you know, even for me at work, and we'll talk more about this in another <laughs> video we're going to record, that, you know, I find myself sometimes starting to get frustrated with a client. And then I say, oh, wait a minute. They're inexpensive. They're just being expansive. It's right. who they are. So what do I need to do to help them feel comfortable in this situation? And I think that when you're able to apply that kind of thinking to your kids or to anything else, you're going to be able to de-escalate things that before might have gotten out of control really fast. Right. Intensive kids tend to get into power battles with their parents really fast. And being able to avoid engaging the power battle is one of the best tools for an, a parent, yeah. parent in yeah. that situation. Because the only way to really win that battle is for it to never happen, right. to not engage it. Right. It just doesn't happen. You get on the same side of the table as your kid. You find your common goals and you move forward. Yeah. It's just like a hostage negotiation, only better. <laughs> Definitely better. Yes. Thank you.